Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, slides in the middle, yes. Um, so, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bram Vogelaar, and we'll be, as discussed, uh, well, not discussed, as announced, we're going to talk about how to run Nomad and Waypoint, um, and especially the, the payloads on those tools in a secure way. Yes. So a uh, little background about me. I used to be, well, I went to university to become a molecular biologist. Uh, I worked at big pharma, big uh, universities. And that was in the period where big data became a thing in uh, pharmaceutical research or uh, bioinformatics in general. It's not the big data you think about. is anything that didn't fit in an Excel sheet was big data. Um, so. Turns out I was a lot better at programming the Excel sheets than I was at generating the data. And in, I descended even further into the dark side because in the academic world, when you're the developer guy or the bioinformatics guy, you also turn out to be the, the, uh, the operations person. Turns out I was even better at that than writing code. So now I work at the factory as an operation, well, in operations or in the DevOps, SRE, buzzword bingo um, space. Um, um, for 2022, I'm also a HashiCorp ambassador, and I am a Nomad Core contributor. So I know a little bit about the products, and hopefully I can explain a bit more to you. But to start off today, I would like you to ponder the following statement. The intern proudly presented that he fixed the problem with our main product, our money maker, by fixing the database connection. Right. And you would be a better person than I was if your reaction wasn't the following. Wait, what? Um, because nobody in the room actually thought the, well, it's, it's, it's a real problem. It's a real thing that happened. So it's not a, a contrived uh, example. This actually happened, and at that point in time, we all looked at the intern because nobody in the room, none of the, de the seniors on deck thought the problem was with the, well, we say here the database connections, all names are uh, anonymized, so it wasn't the database, but the problem he was trying to fix wasn't anywhere near where we thought the problem was. So of course, the, um, the first initial reaction for everybody was, why did you deploy by yourself? Why did you deploy on Friday? We do, do not do that here. Um, and then, but instead of scolding our new colleague and this presentation ending in slide three, we basically thought, why wouldn't we allow this intern to deploy on Fridays all by himself? What would we need to have in place to trust whatever he's writing um, and make the deploy to production himself. Right. The, he didn't make the case for himself any better, because when we opened our IDEs and checked out this last commit, we basically saw something very obscure. This is not the exact code. This is very obscure code that actually won a obscure code uh, competition. It's basically a Mandelbrot generating Mandelbrot that looks like Mandelbrot. This, the shape is called a Mandelbrot, and it got very complex by looking at it this way. And his code was very similar. Right? It wasn't immediately obvious what happened or what changes he made, why he was making it. And of course, inline documentation was nowhere to be found. Uh, git commit message was fixed problem. So it didn't help us uh, getting further and trusting whatever he did. And of course, next belly thought is, let's lock it all down. right? If we can't deploy, we're not going to break anything. But of course, that's never the option, because locking it all down, people need to get products out. So they're going to find a way around it, and then we'll have some form of fake news uh, lockdown system for management to say, no, but nothing can be deployed. But you know, if you know the magic password, you can get around it. So we need to find a balance between stopping people doing dumb stuff and making sure they can do their work in a safe and secure way. And for that, there's a reason for that. 
right? We don't write code, we don't write and push code because we like to write and code, uh, push code, but because we want this code out in front of users in production. So anything that we place in between the developer station and production or in front of users, it needs to help us get confident about production or have trust in production, right? So I, I borrowed this definition from something called chaos engineering, which is a surpassing step in, um, in your, your testing platform. And the, the three words I really want to use or borrow is confidence in production. So anything that you do needs to increase confidence. So of course, we start at looking at adding tests, things like unit tests, basically meaning uh, does the code do what we think it should do in the way we think it, it, uh, we need it? Um, on top of that, you have integration tests, and the surpassing step of those are system integration and end-to-end -end tests, where you basically put it in front of uh, the real world and check it out if it's your assumptions still hold true. And if you're a fan of, of promise theory, you'll, you even check the contracts or the promises that the code makes, and you also tag those against the not-so-happy path or the, the, the dark side, or whatever you want to call it. Because um, let's step back to our 16-year-old self. Right? If I, my mom asked, did you clean your room? The answer was, of course, I cleaned my room. But reality would be quite different. right? So um, with code, it can be the same. Code can say it does something, but you need to validate it actually does uh, the stuff. And one of the other steps in the process is um, making sure you share the pain, not, not only to uh, prevent um, colleagues writing um, obscure code or hardly legible code, but it's also the first step to help people look at um, right, uh, nefarious changes. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but there's an op uh, opportunity for people to in inject nefarious uh, steps. This especially becomes interesting, well, interesting, uh, or a target when you're in a highly regulated industry like banking or something else that has high value. So implement two, something called two-man four eyes or two-person four eyes, right? And have someone just look at it. And if the code is obscure, have a conversation. If it doesn't completely fit whatever you want to wanna do, uh, that's the point where you can stop it. And basically, the whole shift left after exercise we just did. Um, happens there. And of course, we want to build um, this into an automated process because nobody likes doing this uh, manually. That's basically the reason I turned from uh, molecular biology into um, a programmer because I didn't like. I was too lazy to do it manually and just automated things away. And at this point, I want to introduce Waypoint because that's one of the newer products at HashiCorp that I really, really like. Um, it provides a, yeah, for me, a CI CD uh, workflow that will work across many platforms. It extendable by self written plugins, or the ecosystem is actually ramping up. So that's probably a plugin already for the problem you have or the, the thing you want to deploy to. And it's written in the hopefully at this point familiar uh, HCL, the HashiCorp configuration language that is pretty much available in. in any of their, uh, their products. So what does the pipeline look like? It's, as I said, structu a structured way, although this morning they announced uh, freeform pipelines. But so there's a set nomenclature about how to do things. There's three main steps. You have a build, you have a deploy, and then a release step. So if you're used to things like Jenkins, it's always freeform. Um, especially the release step is very nice that they managed to think about um, putting it in there because it's not normally it gets shoehorned in the next sprint at some point. Right? It's not something we think about. And because naming things is hard when you use a thing like Jenkins, you always end up writing bash, and there's going to be more bash scripts that all do install, but they're not installing it in the same way. And the install script probably also does some configuration, or it, it turns on monitoring, or maybe not, right? depending on the, on the variable. So in Waypoint, there is actually a structured way of doing things. Right? If you open one Waypoint find, uh, or you open the next one, it's going to look the same. So 
it's, mm, if you look for changes, it's going to be a structured way. Like if you, how does it actually work? So it uses reusable, repeatable, well, it used to be scripts and that's plugins. So in this case, I'm showing a simple, you know, build my Docker image um, and then run it somewhere. So, some, so up until now, we've been discussing you know, mistakenly bad code trying to get to production. But it's not just uh, mistakenly bad code, there's also bad actors or potentially bad actors that are trying to get you to run or deploy code that you probably didn't want to or shouldn't have. So the next one is, so we, we're done with the you know, mistakenly bad code, and now we're going to look at how we're going to lock the system down to prevent any bad happening. So the statement here is do not trust the internet. Um, the person that told me this used a bit less PC version of this, but let's, let's stick with the don't trust the internet. Because we want to stand on the shoulder of giants, right? If you write code, you want to write code that will get our product into the next phase. So we don't want to rewrite or write another uh, database management layer, right? Just use something that someone else wrote before you, right? And stand on the shoulder of giants. Use anything from your standardized package manager in the, your favorite language, right? Use NPM, use Maven, use Composer, use RubyGems. So on one hand, I say, don't trust the internet. On the other hand, say, please use the internet, because that's where the good stuff is. So how do we differentiate between those two? So be self-sufficient, right? Have a repo of anything you, try, you, you need to build your product, right? Have it in-house. Mirror your, your OS packages, mirror NPM, stick it in an artifactory and build your own code packages and stick them in there too, because servers will die at some point. And then you still have your backup somewhere where you basically deploy from. And this also gives us the following, uh, another advantage, like right? know thyself, especially in uh, language ecosystems like Node, like Ruby. We like, they like to write small packages that basically include other packages that include other packages. So if you have a small, pro, uh, small product, it's not uncommon to pull in hundreds of other packages. Um, so for that, we want to use something called a software bill of material. It's something that came out of corporate America. It, it sounds very boring, but it's going to help you a lot. Right? We've got, it's going to teach us, or tell us, what um, products or packages we're actually pulling in, and what kind of well, less licenses those have. Right? If you have a commercial product, you cannot use uh, all the open source licenses as you want. And it's also going to tell us, or could potentially tell us, if we have a known list, we can validate it against known CVEs, and we can qu very quickly pick up on, like, are we vulnerable to the next log4j? I worked at a customer where we had this in place, took us an hour to get it done. Other uh, customers, it was, you know, it was terrible. So some took a week to work out, are we vulnerable? It wasn't even like we fixed it in a week. No, it's, are we vulnerable and do we need to fix it? So how we combine these two? Right. If you put garbage in, it's, it's not gonna ever gonna get better. It's only gonna degrade even further. Right? So at the place of waypoint, basically in your CI, CD, you need to do the checks that you uh, have a product of, of a good enough quality. So in waypoint, you can actually extend it by using before and after hooks, where I can basically do something called, uh, well, do my vulnerability scans like uh, with it a product like SNCC, and at the end, I can actually fingerprint the product I have produced. Right? So I know what I've built, I know what the fingerprint is, and so in the next processes, I actually can check if this fingerprint is still the same. Um, so that brings me to the next thing. Promote, don't promote code, promote artifacts. Right? Build native OS packages 
or if you're a hipster or you're going to the cloud, build Docker images. Right, and promote those. Don't, don't merge a, a branch called acceptance into production and then do an NPM install on, on prod. Because your continuity problem might become actual downtime and money costing downtime. Because if an angry developer pulls a package because he's angry at NPM, you're basically uh, screwed. You cannot deploy any further. Um, and that actually brings us to the next step. Of course, we have, a art we have an artifact, we have a Docker image, we know the fingerprint, it needs to run somewhere. And the lovely people at HashiCorp have a product for this. Uh, it's called Nomad. Um, it can do pretty much any dynamic workload scheduling you want, but in the following exercises, we're going to follow it, our Docker image. It has native integration with consoles or so service discovery. It has native integration with Vault, so you can have secrets for free. Although this morning, they announced you don't actually need those two. Um, but it has, uh, it has availability. You can, have, you can lock it down, basically, uh, based on tokens. Um, in 1.3, I think, uh, OIDC is coming. And of course, the jobs are written in HCL which is something we know before from our waypoint, we know from our Terraform code, so we don't actually have to teach people too many new tricks. So how does uh, that combine? Right, we have the, the same waypoint file we had before, and now we're actually in the deploy phase, we're replacing our local exec with something we deploy to Nomad. Simple, use Nomad, point to my lab data center and have a namespace called theory, because if it th works in theory, we can deploy to reality. Um, the job in Nomad, they're similarly built up. I have a job called Lorem Ipsum, because naming things is hard. Um, we have a front end uh, group that has a task called server, uh, of which is going to run our, our Docker image. And we're going to expose it on a port 8080. And this is going to be interesting when you start doing service meshes. Of course, this is a hard-coded job. Um, if you want to tweak your Nomad deploys, if you're a bit further along the line, you can actually use, still use a Nomad file. Where I basically point it to a local file. This is my, my, uh, my Nomad job. And we're taking it from there. I'm still working on Nomad pack integration. Uh, but if you want to run a normal Nomad job, that's totally doable. And of course, you also want secrets. So Vault didn't fit on these first slide, so, but we're, we need to go fault. Right, because of course, who in this room has a CI, CD user or role that basically can do anything? And the password's been around since day one of the company. Uh, people that have been off-boarded still have this post, uh, the passport with a, a, uh, a post-it somewhere on there. Um, so we're actually vulnerable to this password leaking or even being used in the real world. And the, one of the beautiful things of Vault is that it can also do what I like to call password as a service. Right? It has the ability to do uh, one-time passwords or a passwords with a self-expiring uh, timeline. Right? If you need uh, your CI CD needs SSH into machine, the it, Vault can generate has a, a, an access token or an access mechanism that gives the CRCD access to the next ten, for about 10 minutes, do the deploy, and expire the, uh, the access right after that. So uh, again, we're not leaking any, uh, anything that can bite us later by someone trying to hack in uh, to our systems. So how do we combine this with, um, with, with Waypoint or... Uh, so we basically have a variable we pointed at our, our, our Vault instance, and we, we pull in a secret. It gets used during the, the waypoint up or waypoint deploy, and then it gets forgotten again, or within a reasonable time frame, gets forgotten again. So we now get to a point that we have our image. We know how we can run it on Nomad. But as I said, do not trust the internet. And because we're all in the cloud, we're probably using a Docker registry from uh, one of the big cloud providers. 
which is pretty much on an open network, although it's probably in a VPC, but it's glued together. So to get from our, um, our registry into our, our running nomad system, we also need to put some checks in place, right? We cannot directly trust the, um, the system. And that's why we fingerprinted it in the first place anyway. So the example I'm showing now is something where we're using something called Harbor, which is a CNCF-backed um, uh, Docker registry that does have uh, trust built into it, or you can use it in a trustful way. Right, so how do we do this? We generate a key. Please have Vault do this for you. Um, but in this case, that didn't fit on the slide deck. Um, so I have uh, Docker generate me a key. I load it into Docker, and then I uh, sign it into my, my user saying, this is my key. Um, so anything that is signed with this means that I, it was me. And of course, make sure that the key doesn't end up in Git or um, you expose it somewhere uh, and anywhere else. So sign your name, right? It was me that uh, created this image. For that, we need to export a, a environment variable called docker underscore content trust equals one. We can also have this inside our nomad cluster. And in this case, I'm going to say that I trust the image that was produced and, it was, and I, I trust it in, to the extent that I'm going to sign my name on it. I'm going to uh, sign, have Docker sign my image. I'm going to then push it to the registry. And of course, images can be corrupted or, God forbid, um, it actually got manipulated somehow so I can also revoke it by simple Docker trust revoke. Right. And then we need to validate, so in Nomad, when it lands, we need to validate that what, we, what showed up is actually what we produced. Um, I'm still working on the, on the Waypoint integration, but basically we have a local Docker um, command now that says Docker trust inspect the image I produced, or someone produced for me. Um, if you want to do the Nomad, you can do it quite easily, although it's a, still a bit finicky, right? You can have a pre-task pre that checks the image coming in, but the downside, of course, is that now all developers need to have this pre-task pre in their, their Nomad configuration. It would be lovely if we can do this during the, the Waypoint deploy so that we have the, the lovely tool do it for us. And then we can actually pull it while we, when, or it, Nomad pulls it for us, of course, uh, in when it gets run um, in that situation. So that brings us actually to, to the end. Um, so hopefully I've shown you the entire path of, of uh, getting code into production and in front of users in such a way that we can now trust the product being run. Right? We, we discussed having users uh, not push bad or mistakenly bad code. We discussed how we can actually make sure that what we produce is what we think we produce. And then we discussed um, that we trust whatever we run is what we think it is. And that brings us to the last slide. If you want to talk more, you can email me at the, the above email address. You want to rant on Twitter, that's my handle. And at this point, my slide deck is also already on SlideShare. So if you want to review this, um, the slides are there. And the question is going to be, uh, we're not going to do it on stage. I'm going to be just left off, my left off uh, the podium. Uh, we can discuss a bit more.